In 2014, two young women from the Netherlands, Chris Kremers and Lisanne Froon, ages 21 and 22, they traveled to Panama for what was supposed to be six weeks of travel with purpose. They wanted to experience a different culture, be really immersed in it. They had made plans to stay with the host family, and they were going to volunteer at a local children's school. This would really give them a chance to learn Spanish and also to explore the region. Panama has popular beaches, but also mountains, volcanoes, and many hiking trails that are popular among travelers. They left the Netherlands on March 15, 2014. This is a photo of them at the airport saying goodbye to their parents. They arrived in Panama and stayed in a town known as Bocas del Toro, where they spent two weeks. Bocas del Toro is the tourist destination, a beach town with resorts, restaurants, nightlife, and many things to do. The beaches have clear blue color and dolphin sightings are very common. It's a beautiful tropical destination that they described as paradise. There's a lot of young people there, including travelers from Europe. Chris and Lisanne actually met and befriended other young people from the Netherlands, who helped them feel very much more comfortable in a foreign land. But after spending two weeks in Bocas del Toro, they traveled inland to their next destination, the town of Boquete, which was a far different experience than their time at the beach. We know this because Chris and Lisanne kept diaries and they documented the sharp contrast that they experienced after arriving in the rural mountain town of Boquete. Lisanne wrote in her diary about feeling a sudden change. I think many would call it a culture shock. She wrote in her diary about struggling with feelings of regret, about feeling naive for thinking she was prepared for a trip such as this one. On March 29, she wrote, I'm sitting here with tears in my eyes rolling down my cheeks. The view of the mountains is beautiful. The house is spacious and the family friendly. I'm even here with Chris, who is so very familiar. But still, I just want to go home. I had no problem for two weeks and suddenly I feel completely crazy. The transition from those two weeks of lively vacation to stepping into the life of a real Panamanian family is just too much for me. I can't make sense of it and it's all too real. This is not a vacation anymore. I was too naive to think I could handle this because this is exactly the type of situation that I can't handle. Not even now that I'm 22 and living on my own. I'm way over my head. I want my mom and dad to hold me tight and tell me that everything will be all right. But I can't let them know how I feel now because I don't want them to worry. It is precisely because I'm 22 that I think I have to solve this by myself. Still, right now, I feel like a two-year-old toddler screaming for her mother, who is just two meters away. I didn't really want this, but I went anyway. I thought I would be able to handle this, the final test before I can be really happy with myself. But so far, I have failed badly. I think her feelings were completely reasonable and valid. It's what you would expect out of most people in a similar situation. Here she was, a young woman in her early 20s with limited life experience, limited travel experience, who suddenly finds herself in a remote area in a distant, underdeveloped country where she doesn't know the culture or even speak the language, and she's all alone with her equally inexperienced friend. The overwhelming and dreading reality of just how far away from home they were must have been really difficult to process. They were supposed to start their volunteer work on Monday, March 31st, but when they arrived at the children's school, they were turned away and told that they were not needed until the next week. This was confusing and very frustrating as this had been planned for months. They did not understand why the school turned them away. They wrote in their diary that day that they did not feel welcome and that they were treated poorly by a rude employee at the school. Several rumors have been discussed about why they were turned away from the school. Some people say that their point of contact who was supposed to welcome them and guide them and train them had to leave town due to a family emergency. Other rumors mentioned that their Spanish wasn't good enough to be of much service so they were told to come back after improving their Spanish. Other rumors say that it was a simple scheduling error. Although disappointing, they were not going to let this mishap change their overall plans. So they went to their other point of contact, which was a language school, where they could use a computer and internet to research alternative volunteer options and things they could do in town. On the morning of April 1st, 
they left the host family home and they did not return that night. In fact, they would never be seen alive again. At first, the host family did not report them missing that night because according to them, they were not worried because guests usually stay out. The next morning around 8 a.m. on April 2nd, a man arrived at the language school looking for Chris and Lisanne. The man was a tour guide claiming that the girls had booked his services and he was told to meet them there. He waited for about 30 minutes at the language school alongside a German woman who worked there. But after a while, both of them decided to go together to the host family's house to see if the girls were still there, considering that maybe they had overslept or forgotten about their appointment. But no one came to the door, so they decided to call the owner of the home. When the host family mother answered the phone and she heard that the girls didn't show up to their appointment, she was immediately alarmed and told them about a spare key in the backyard. She told the tour guide to go inside the house and knock on their bedroom door and to just open it if no one answered. They found no one in their bedrooms and it appeared that no one had slept on those beds the night before. Allegedly, the tour guide said that the German woman from the language school advised them not to alarm anyone, that they should instead go looking for them at the farm where they were supposed to do the tour with him. Perhaps the girls had misunderstood where to meet with him. But after looking for them at the farm and finding nothing and waiting for them to hopefully return on their own, they finally went to the local police station at night to report them missing. It's frustrating to learn that a whole day was wasted and devoid of any search efforts because they did not report them missing until later at night. The next day, April 3rd, local authorities organized searches around town, but no one knew where the girls had gone. So the search history on the computer was the only thing they had to maybe suggest that they had gone on a trail called El Pianista. El Pianista is a hiking trail that winds through open dairy lands into dense wooded areas as it changes climate conditions into a humid cloud forest due to the changes in elevation. The hike up the trail can take up a few hours until it reaches a viewpoint, a summit, where, on a clear day, you can see a wide angle of view including the town of Buquete far below. But in order to return, a hiker must turn around and follow the same path back down. Initial search efforts were widespread around the town of Boquete and they included ground and aerial searches over El Pianista Trail where it was believed that they might have gone hiking. The story quickly traveled back home and shocked everyone in the Netherlands. It was constantly on the news and everyone followed the situation closely. Both of the girls' parents traveled to Panama and on April 6, along with detectives and dog units from the Netherlands, they helped conduct a full-scale search for 10 days. They also offered a reward of $30,000 to anyone with information that would help find the missing girls. After many extensive searches, they did not find a single trace of the girls and some people began to wonder if they had ever gone up the trail. Perhaps they were looking in the wrong place. A spokesperson involved with coordinating the searches told the press that if the girls had indeed been lost on the trail or injured or stranded, they would have found them by now. Soon after that, rumors of foul play started to circulate, with theories ranging from murder to human trafficking and even cannibalism. After two weeks, most of the large-scale search efforts winded down, but the mystery of their disappearance continued to evolve with more questions and less answers. Many witnesses claimed to have seen the girls the day they went missing, but conflicting accounts made them unreliable and they were never confirmed. Some people claimed that they saw the girls starting the Pianista Trail around 4 p.m., while other people claimed to have seen them at a different trail. A taxicab driver, believed to be the last person to see them alive, claimed that he dropped them off near the beginning of the trail around 3.30. The owner of a restaurant that's located at the bottom of the trail said that his dog followed the girls into the trail and later returned without them. There were other neighbors along the trail that said they saw the girls near the start of the trail. All these sightings imply that they started the trail at 4 p.m., which is considered late in the day and far from optimal because of diminishing sunlight as it gets closer to sundown hours. It is not rare for tourists to get lost on hiking trails, so everyone first assumed that they would be found alive. But after weeks turned into months, full-scale searches and volunteer searches, hopes to find them began to fade and the case began to turn cold. They actually never found Chris and Lisanne, or even a trace of them. 
Two months went by without any new developments or any signs of the missing Dutch girls. Suddenly, Lisanne's blue backpack was found under mysterious circumstances. A native indigenous woman claimed to have found it close to a river near the remote area of Alto Romero, a desolate area deep in the mountains where modern civilization hasn't fully yet reached. It seemed unlikely that Chris and Lisanne would have hiked that far away from civilization. This also interfered with theories that they may have gotten injured or stranded. It was also troublesome for the theory that they may have lost their sense of orientation and gotten lost because all they had to do was just turn around and follow the trail back. The trail has well-defined boundaries that make it very difficult, almost impossible, to wander away from it. The trail has rocks and gravel outlining the way, almost like a yellow brick road. The vegetation surrounding the trail is very dense, almost chest high in some areas. One could assume that anyone with a lot of exposed skin to the elements would be absolutely discouraged from stepping out of the trail and into the high bushes where all kinds of ants, ticks, spiders, and snakes could brush onto you. In some areas of the trail, centuries of erosion have created tall walls along the path that make it physically impossible to get off the trail. So how could they get lost and walk that far out deep into the mountains? How did Lisanne's blue backpack end up so far away from the tourist part of the trail? Could it be possible that an unknown third party took the backpack there? Or did they accidentally drop the backpack near a creek and then the river carried it all the way to where it was found? No answers, just more questions. The indigenous woman that found the backpack said that she had not seen it there before on previous days. The backpack contained Chris and Lisanne's sunglasses, $83 in cash, one of their passports, a water bottle, a digital camera, two bras, and both of their cell phones. There are conflicting rumors regarding the state of the backpack, ranging from showing signs of being dirty and exposed to the elements for a long time, to relatively clean and in good condition. The local people that retrieved the backpack emptied out its contents so they could dry them off. Some have said that this was unfortunate because it disturbed and contaminated potential evidence, but it's hard to blame the indigenous people for the way they handle the backpack because, after all, they live in isolated, remote areas, disconnected from modern civilization. It's not like they have seen a lot of true crime episodes and they knew better not to mishandle potential evidence. After the contents of the backpacks were processed by authorities in Panama, they were transferred to authorities in the Netherlands for forensic analysis of the phones and the digital camera, where they successfully extracted photos that confirmed that Chris and Lisanne had indeed gone hiking on the Pianista Trail. This was a huge development because it provided some clues to their last known location. The metadata from the digital photos placed the girls on a timeline that had them starting the trail at around 11.30 a.m. The photos show that it was a clear sunny day and Chris and Lisanne went hiking on the trail through the open pastures and following the path into the rainforest until they reached the summit, a place known as El Mirador which is a scenic viewpoint that allows someone to see far into the distant horizon on a clear day. The town of Boquete can be seen all the way down the valley, which in a way reminds any hiker that in order to go back, you have to turn around and follow back the path. This point at the summit is where most people turn around and go back, especially tourists. The summit is the tourist attraction of the trail, so going beyond the trail there really isn't anything more to explore for most people. It doesn't make much sense that a pair of young girls without much experience would venture past the point. But an argument can be made that it was actually the lack of experience that contributed to the decision of going beyond the point. Maybe it was just excitement and a sense of adventure. The path forward is just more of the same. Dense vegetation and rocky winding paths. The only reason there is a path that goes beyond the summit is because the native indigenous people use it to move cattle and to move supplies between their villages and into the towns below, and they've been doing this for the past century. But going beyond this point is going into desolate, undeveloped areas without any access to a cell phone signal. There are only a few more photos taken after the photos on the summit. These last photos confirm that they did not turn around as they should have, but instead they went beyond the summit. The location of these photos are approximately 15 to 20 minutes past the summit. 
These are the last photos that would be considered normal. Some of the forensic data recovered from their cell phones revealed some concerning details. They had tried to call emergency services several times over the first three days of their disappearance. The first time they tried calling emergency services was actually on the first day, approximately two hours after the last normal photo. Unfortunately, they never had a signal. Both of their cell phones were powered on and off multiple times a day until Isan's phone died on April 4th. The PIN code for Chris's iPhone was entered correctly up until 1.37 p.m. on April 5th, but after that, Chris's phone was turned on and off, but several wrong attempts to enter the PIN code were made. The correct PIN code was never entered again. And then, there was no activity on the phone on April 7, 8, 9, and 10. But on April 11, there was one final attempt made at 10.51 a.m. to check for a signal. The phone remained on for about an hour until it was turned off again at 11.56 a.m. There would be no further activity on the phone again, even though it still had 22% battery. There were no video messages recorded documenting anything that may have happened. No text messages were attempted, no pictures taken with either phone, no notes, no goodbye messages. As mentioned earlier, these photos taken on April 1st were the last normal photos. There would be no more normal photos taken on the digital camera. But a week later, on April 8, starting at 1 a.m., 90 flash photos were taken that do not make any sense. All the photos seemed to aim randomly without any purpose, showing edges of rocks, branches. There's some photos with twigs with pieces of plastic attached to them. There's some photos that look like there's shredded pieces of paper. And most disturbingly, there is a photo that shows the back of Chris's head on a single frame. And then the last photo was taken around 4 a.m. without any further context or explanation. It's just so eerie to see 90 photos without any obvious purpose, and one of them shows the back of Chris's head. It just makes it all seem like the elements of a found footage horror movie. New searches were organized near the area where the backpack was found. Eventually, they found some articles of clothing that were later confirmed to belong to the missing girls, including rumors that Chris's shorts were found neatly folded on top of a rock. Almost a week after the backpack was found, the first remains of a body were found. A boot with a decomposing foot inside and a pelvic hip bone were found several miles away from the trail. Forensic DNA analysis confirmed that the remains in the boot belonged to Lisanne and the hip bone belonged to Chris. It has been reported that the bones were in different stages of decomposition. It appeared that Chris's bones had decomposed first. Some people have said that this implies that Chris died first. Multiple agencies from Panama and teams from the Netherlands continue to search the areas for more skeletal remains and for any evidence pointing to foul play. They found a few more scattered bones that belonged to Chris and Lisanne, but among those remains, they also found bone fragments that did not belong to any of the Dutch girls. But the majority of the bones were never found. Many experts argue that there was enough circumstantial evidence to suggest that the girls were murdered. But after months without any new developments, Panamanian authorities concluded that Chris and Lisanne were most likely to have been involved in a fatal accident near the Pianista Trail. Some rumors accused Panama authorities of having handled investigation inadequately and rushing to close the case in order to protect Panama's image and tourist industry. The final report suggests that a fatal accident was the cause of their demise. Chris's parents returned to Panama and walked the trail and recorded their experience on video. They walked for almost an hour past their last known location based on that last normal photo and determined that it seemed out of character for them to keep going further past the summit. Chris's parents stated that they didn't believe they would have gone that far into the mountain. They emphasized several times how there are no cliffs or slopes along the way where they could have had a catastrophic fall. They also point out that the few streams of water that they had to cross were not big enough to sweep them away. Chris's parents make additional comments emphasizing about how unlikely they think the possibility that they got lost is because they just walk the same path and they simply can't see a way to get lost. The path is designed to keep you on the path and makes it almost impossible to wander away from it. Chris's mom says that they would have had to make an effort to get lost and that it would have been out of character for them to do that. They say that even if they had gotten injured, 
they would have stayed on the path and someone would have eventually found them, either someone passing by or one of the many search parties that went through the trail. The dad stated that it would take another two hours of hiking to reach a cable bridge where it was suggested it was the point where they fell from. But the parents noted that the first emergency call was made quite a distance before reaching that cable bridge, implying that they were in distress long before being able to reach that cable bridge. If you look at these pictures of the cable bridge and what it takes to walk through one of them, it does seem unlikely that two girls with limited experience would have gone that far seen that bridge and wanted to continue to go through it. This is what the cable bridge looks like. I don't think I would want to cross the bridge. And if I was doing this trip with a friend and we were lost, I think if one of us wanted to go through the bridge, the other one wouldn't. It just seems unlikely that both of them saw this bridge without any experience, without a guide, and they both decided to go across it. On October 31st, 2014, the families had a funeral service where Chris and Lisanne's remains were put to rest. The way the photos display how the day of their disappearance unfolded is haunting. The photos document a beautiful day filled with a sense of adventure and independence until reaching the summit where they captured a feeling of accomplishment, pride, and glee, only for something unexpected to take place with a sinister and a catastrophic outcome. What really happened to Chris and Lisanne? I don't think we'll ever know. I think that mountain swallowed the truth. I didn't want to get into some of the theories and speculations about this case because you can truly go down a rabbit hole and we could spend a couple hours talking about them and not really find any answers. I have spent close to 50 hours looking through old posts and threads going back many years and there is a lot of information to come through and as you can imagine there is also a lot of inaccurate information littered along the way. Even some of the articles haven't been updated and corrected with some of the information that was later clarified, thus continuing to spread inaccurate information. I think I will make another video in this case, debunking and clarifying some of the most common questions that pop up and possibly touching on some of the most discussed theories regarding foul play versus getting lost and stranded. I don't know when I'll make those videos, but subscribe to the channel if you're interested in watching those videos. Five years before the disappearance of Chris and Lisanne, a British tourist disappeared in the same town of Boquete. He was never found. In 2017, a German tourist traveling alone in Panama was hiking near the town of Santa Fe and got lost. She was found four days later wandering alongside a river. She had been held captive against her will by three men until she found an opportunity to escape. A 23-year-old American tourist went missing on a trail in Panama in 2017. If you found any value in this video, you can return the value for value by commenting, liking, or subscribing.